Yes, Mr. Hanks. Thank you, Mr. President. I was just before the break uh, going to deal with the question of the Malici patients at paragraphs 1505 to 1511 of the prosecution's brief and what I shall call the Slavantian in point. Um, the child chamber needs to look with care, we submit, at P1309, an intercepted radio communication between General Pandurovich and Serovich. Uh, we, we say it is plain, or at least it is a reasonable inference to draw in Vinko Pandurovich's favour, that he, during that conversation, was entitled to believe that the wounded prisoners were being taken to Batkovitsi, a prisoner exchange camp, and that Serovich was arranging that. So whether it was Popovich, Serovich, or somebody else who was overseeing the operation, that is Pandurovich's evidence as to what he thought would happen. So he did, we submit, satisfy himself sufficiently that those prisoners would be afforded the treatment they were entitled to. Uh, add to that, please, the fact that contemporaneously with this, Pandurovich did successfully arrange for all the other prisoners at Standard to go to Batkovich and be exchanged. As a matter of fact, several of those prisoners had been people who escaped executions. Indeed, there was no reason to suppose during that period of time that anybody taken prisoner was more or less likely to be a witness of war crimes than anybody else. So the fact that he sent 150 for exchange is an indication that they were all being treated similarly. Um, thank you. I, I, the, the intercepts P1309, not P1009. Uh, I'm going to move on very swiftly now, please, to the question of uh, effective control of the killing operation in Zvornik. Um, in determining the individual criminal responsibility as well as the command responsibility of the accused on this indictment in relation to the murders in Zvornik, we submit that you're going to have to ask yourselves six questions <coughs> from our point of view. Was Biara in Zvornik at the various execution sites? Was Popovich in Zvornik at the various execution sites? Uh, under whose orders were they? What units and what men did they have at their disposal? Were they empowered to give orders to those men and or units, and did elements of the Zvornik Brigade receive orders from them which they obeyed? It, it's perhaps inescapable in such a large piece of work put together under such pressure that the prosecution's brief should show substantial and significant inconsistencies, but it does. And there is no area where it shows more marked inconsistencies than in the way it pleads its case against Vinko Pandurovich, as opposed to the way it pleads its case against the security officers in the dock. T to give one classic example, there are two paragraphs which are repeated virtually verbatim, but for one critical word. In paragraph 1583, the Pandurovich section, you will find the prosecution alleging that in the famous 3,500 parcels intercept, Biara is calling Kerstich because he needs his authority to take resources for the murder operation. Whereas in paragraph 2,270, in the section of the brief that pleads the case against Biara, they say that Biara is calling Kerstich because he needs merely his assistance. Those two words are far from synonymous. In, in relation to the section of the case pleaded against Pandurovich, the only piece of evidence which the prosecution rely on to show that what was going on in Zvornik 
was an example of the normal operation of the chain of command is that intercept. They rely on nothing else. Uh, we submit that that interpretation of that intercept is completely wrong. It doesn't show the operation of a normal chain of command at all. Kerstich and Biara are not connected through any normal chain of command. Neither is subordinate or superior to the other. Biara's superior is Ptolemyr or Miladic, and Kerstich's superior is Miladic. The prosecution agrees with that at paragraph 2260. Kerstich's subordinate in the circumstances would be Pandorovich, of course, who is not mentioned by either of them during the course of this conversation at such a critical time. Moreover, Kerstich's suggestion that Bayara should take units of the Bratinac Brigade or from the MOOP indicates no normal chain of command whatsoever. In relation to that, it was Judge Prost who pointed out the quote used a couple of times in the prosecution's final brief that Biara Popovich were doing what they wanted, taking whomever they wanted, wherever they wanted. And there is a remarkable echo of that phrase from poor, weak Dragon Jokic uh, in the very text of this intercept. You may think when... Uh, Judge Pross put that question to Mr. McCloskey. He rather ducked the issue. But we will come to it more fully now as we analyse the prosecution's case against Biara and Popovich. I should briefly respond to something Mr. Ostrich said the other day about that intercept. Uh, I mean him no harm, but my submission is when his client uttered the words, uh, I have three and a half parcels to distribute, he was there accepting a measure of responsibility which he was taking on. Contrary to the prosecution's submission in closing and their, their final brief in our submission makes it plain that their case against Colonel Biara was that he was in command of a joint task or operation. Without fur further elaboration, we invite your attention specifically to the following paragraphs of the prosecution's final brief. 2186, 2223, 2300, 2301. Biara is criminally responsible for planning and instigating the crimes. 2194, he coordinated and oversaw the crimes. 2199, he had a pivotal role in the organisation, coordination and oversight of the JCEs charged in the indictment. 2227, coordination and control of the burial process. 2283, in charge of the operation. 2284, planned and ordered to have the prisoners transferred to Zvornik for detention and execution. 2301, ordered the commission of the crimes for which he is charged in the indictment. If you required any corroboration that those sort of terms in contemporary Yugoslavian military literature were all command functions, you need look no further than P699, page 13 in the English points 13, 14 and 15, the definition of command functions. This section of the brief also we submit shows the plainest operation of an abnormal chain of command. 2189, 2221, 2223. Biara instructing Momin and Nikolic on the 13th of July to go to Zvornik <coughs> and pass on an order to Drago Nikolic to prepare the transfer of the prisoners without reference to Pandorovic, Abrenovic or Blagojevic. 2191, the meeting on the morning of the 14th of July between Biara Popovich and Drago Nikolic at the Zvornik Brigade headquarters 
to plan the logistics of the murder operation, again without reference or knowledge of Pandurovich or Abrenovich. 2198, supervising the reburial work of the security officers without the knowledge of Abrenovich. 2252, Biara and Nikolic were both closely involved in the management of the murder operation. And when there, there were problems with the operations, others looked to them to solve them. Again, not to Pandurovich. <coughs> 2253, Biara was working out of the Zvornik Brigade headquarters on the morning of the 15th, looking for personnel to execute the prisoners detained at Rochevich and Pilica without reference to Pandurovich. 2239-2241, Biara asked PW104 for assistance with the provision of equipment and machinery and involved municipal utility companies. I have to slow down. And lastly, 2301, Biara was relaying or passing on the illegal orders from superiors Miladic and Ptolemyr to subordinate security officers, as well as to the units they engaged to carry out tasks associated with the removal and destruction of the Muslim population. Now, a, a similar exercise could be carried out uh, in relation to Mr. Popovich, but I won't do so. It's really rather too boring. But on the, 10th, uh, on the 3rd of September of this year, in closing argument, perhaps more lyrically, Mr. Van der Poe said this in relation to him. The evidence concerning Bishinus shows the elements of the Drina Corps military police over which Mr. Popovich has com control, as well as the 10th Sabotage Detachment were principally involved in carrying out the executions in Bashina. I will note that these same elements were involved in the crimes that were perpetrated at the Branivo military farm on the 16th of July. The only thing that Mr. Popovich was doing in Bashina on the 23rd of July 1995, as the most senior officer present there, was coordinating, organising and carrying out orders that he would have received from his commands to execute these men. There is really no other explanation for his presence there, no other explanation. The evidence in this case shows that his knowledge, intent and conduct were the same concerning the prisoners that were held in the schools in the Zvornik area, the Arahavat school, where he was present on the 14th of July, the Rochevich school, where he was present on the 15th of July, the Kula school, where he was present on the 16th of July. The nature and extent of his involvement in the Bashina executions virtually parallels the circumstances of his presence and participation in the crimes that were committed in Zvornik. Now, this isn't Dragon Jokic talking. This is counsel for the prosecution. But he might just as well have said on the 14th, 15th and 16th of July, Yara and Popovich were running around taking whomever they wanted, wherever they wanted. In relation to Drago Nikolic, the trial chamber will wish to ask itself whether he received advance notice of the arrival of the prisoners in Zvornik, a matter about which I think it is specifically alleged my client was lying when he said that is what he was told by Dragon Abrenovich. In order to determine that, we submit close regard needs to be had to the following pieces of evidence. Firstly, the vehicle work logs relating to the car in which he would have travelled on the 13th and 14th of July, paying multiple visits to the detention sites. Secondly, that those schools and each of them was ready to receive prisoners before they arrived. And thirdly, the presence of Zvornik Brigade military policemen who were under his control prior to the arrival of the prisoners at Arahavats and Rochevich. Of course he had advanced knowledge that the prisoners were coming. The next question you will wish to ask yourself is, who did he tell? In answering that, the guard will doubtless to be, be had to the fact that, even according to his own theory of command responsibility, he had to tell Abrenovich. And at the time he would have found out, he did find out. At that time he was stuck at the forward command post as a duty officer and needed Abrenovich's permission to leave his post. 
Of course he told Abramovich, if only for that reason. Mr. Van der Poel also told us the other day that the security organs control the military police. With that, we agree. And we have found in this case a body of agreement for that proposition. In spite of the submission of counsel for Drago Nikolic, Pandurovich is not the only person who disagrees with Peter Vuga's opinion on command and control of the military police. PW168 disagrees with it as well, as did Mia Drag Dragutinovic. And they should know they were the ones who had to operate the system. Peter Vuga did not. We reiterate more only our point, our submission, that minute analysis of the rules is a pointless exercise. Mass murder of prisoners isn't in the rules. It isn't defined as counterintelligence work. It isn't defined as any sort of work. And you would be better employed looking at who was doing it and who was ordering them to do it. A, a point is made furthermore at paragraph 1591 of the prosecution's brief, supported only by the evidence of PW168, that any orders given by a senior officer present should be reported to the commander of the unit at the first available opportunity. Three brief points which will become the style of this last few minutes, I fear. PW168 is the only witness who expresses this opinion. Notably, Butler didn't, nor did anybody else who held command within the VRS. Secondly, PW168's evidence on this point contradicts Article 17 of the Provisional Service Regulations. And lastly, in any event, we are dealing with illegal orders in this case. Thus, standard military practice or theory is of limited value. Before I pass on, two short points arising from some remarks of Mr McCloskey the other day. The suggestion that Biara has or had less authority than Kerstich in Zvornik is ridiculous. Biara's special importance to Mladic is highlighted by the prosecution in paragraph 2183. By contrast, Kerstic had only become a commander on the 13th of July. Secondly, as to the prosecution's glib submission that the difference between the criminal responsibility of commanders and security officers is, quote, immense, that is just historically and jurisprudentially inaccurate. In the Bogloyevich case, the trial chamber which heard all the evidence sentenced Momir Nikolic, who pleaded guilty and cooperated with the prosecution, to a much longer term of imprisonment than to his own commander, Blagojevic, who contested his guilt through trial. The use of Zvornik Brigade resources during uh, the period of the executions. Pandurovich gave evidence about which he wasn't challenged that units such as engineering and logistics were effectively self-ordering and that he rarely, if ever, got involved in how the brigade resources were employed. There is also a body of evidence that shows such organs ran through functional chains of command within the brigade and above, and that's dealt with at paragraphs 238 to 242 of our brief. Whilst, of course, it can't be denied that people who were members of the Zvornik Brigade Engineering Company did drive machines, that is not something ordinarily that Pandorovich would have needed to authorise or would have needed to know about on the evidence in this case. Significantly, all logistical and engineering equipment was put to use first whilst Abrenovich was in command. That is confirmed by the prosecution where it says elements of the Zvornik Brigade continued uh, to uh, take part in the murder operation and after Pandurovich's return, paragraph 1272. There is no evidence that Pandurovich actually knew that any of this machinery was being used or that any of these drivers were employed in this way other than what he was told by Abrenovich. There is no evidence that Pandurovich spoke to Jokic and was informed by him of any of this at this time. 
and there is no evidence in the ordinary course of events that the brigade commander would know such things. So the repetitive assertion made by the prosecution about Pandurovich's knowledge and authority is empty. No suggestion of express authority or knowledge was ever put to him. Balkovica. The prosecution have not condescended at all to detail about the numbers of casualties either during this trial or during their investigations. They have left that to us, the defence. They have left us to show you that the losses were far from spectacular and in particular, as known to Pandurovich at the time of the opening of the corridor, were scarcely significant. The, the important or operative number of casualties, you may think, is that which he knew about at the time he chose to open the corridor. Nearly all of the hard evidence about the events of Balkovich on the 15th and 16th of July were put before the trial chamber by the defence. Although they had it, the prosecution did not intend for you to hear the taped radio communications between Vinko Pandurovich and Shemso Ruminovich. It wasn't on their 65 tour list. We had to point out to them that it existed, transcribe it, translate it, and play it for you. It was not us who placed before you the accurate lists. It was us, not them, who placed before you the accurate lists of deceased, wounded, and missing. And it was us, through our client, not the OTP, through its military analyst, who graphically illustrated to you the disposition of all the VRS forces in the region at Pandurovich's disposal as well as giving you an insight into the condition of the column by the time of the opening of the corridor. We thought you needed to know these things to judge Pandorovich's motives. The prosecution didn't want you to know them, and they still, in their brief and oral arguments, urge you to ignore them. The reason is perfectly simple. It damages beyond repair the prosecution's claims that Pandorovich had genocidal intent was a member of the JCE to commit mass murder. What is particularly disturbing about the way in which the prosecution has conducted its case in relation to Balkovica is the startling failure to put to Pandurovic in cross-examination many of the assertions it now relies upon in its final brief. At the time he took the decision to open the corridor, Pandurovic could only have believed he lost 10 men. That is what he wrote in P334, the irregular combat report of the 16th of July. The hearsay and inaccurate estimates of other people listed in paragraph 1597 of the prosecution brief are irrelevant. Pandurovich was not cross-examined about his beliefs as to the precise number of dead, missing or wounded. Secondly, Popovich's opinion on what was militarily justifiable is worthless. Apart from anything else, the evidence shows that he never went to Balkovica on that day. Uh, and, and in our submission, uh, that particular assertion lies ill in the mouth of the prosecution, who so enjoyed joking with Abrenovich about the unlikelihood of Popovich ever putting himself in the way of a bullet or danger in his interview in 2001. This is the point that the prosecution can't get round, nor do they even attempt to do so. Pandurovich's offer to let the whole column go, soldiers and civilians, was first made on the 15th of July. You heard it. The only thing that stopped everybody being let go before he had even written the report of the 15th of July was a quibble over whether they could take their arms with them. It's on tape. It's 7D656. Richard Butler didn't even want to listen to that tape. The prosecution didn't want you to know about it because, quite simply, it's the end of their theories about Pandurovich being compelled to let the prosecution go. Sorry. It's been three years.
You have been to Balkovica. You will remember it is down in a dip, surrounded by hills which represent the forward defence lines of the Zvornik Brigade. The prosecution's desperate military theory in paragraph 1605 of its brief completely ignores the fact that the point which Pandurovic chose for the Muslims to cross the confrontation line was a really vulnerable one for the Muslim column. It also completely ignores the evidence of both Pandurovic and PW168 that he could easily have withdrawn his troops a short distance and covered the area with artillery fire, obliterating the whole column. The quote from Pandorovich's irregular combat report of the 16th of July, I consider Krivaya 95 is not complete as long as a single enemy soldier or civilian remains behind the front lines, is of course ambiguous. The prosecution of course want you to conclude that it is indicative of a pre-existing intention to commit forcible transfer. But bearing in mind we all agree that the breakout of the 28th Division towards Nezuk creating in the process a serious security situation behind Serb lines was not foreseen by anybody before the commencement of Krivaya 95, it is at least equally possible to construe this sentence as meaning that the security situation had to be tidied up before the operation could be considered to be over. We do, of course, also remind you of the extraordinarily similar conduct of Pandurovic in June 1993 at Ustipracha and the practical manifestations of his relationship with Shemso Mamunovic, both of which we submit are highly relevant in determining his true motives for allowing the column to pass. These oral arguments won't make it to September. Uh, I don't mean September 2009, I mean September 1995. Um, I have had to deal with all counts on this indictment, address through the evidence and the submissions I meet all forms of criminal liability, and meet 117 pages specifically devoted to my client in the prosecution's brief. There are, of course, things I have had to leave to one side. I can only hope that if, after all this time, there's something you need my help on, you'll ask me now, um, because now is the chance. <clears throat> I uh, am not going to say anything more than I said uh, in my own final brief, and which Mr Joss so eloquently laid out the other day, about th this being a case in which there's already a pre-existing jurisprudence on sentence and that the give them all life approach is really not helpful to you who might be looking for guidance as to where people fit within the scheme of things according to the prosecution. But I will conclude with what I really started with. <clears throat> We invite you, in addition to the events uh, that directly relate to Vinko Pandurovic in July of 1995, to look a bit wider. We invite you to look at Visegrad in April of 1992, to the contact with Shemso Muminovic and the ceasefires throughout the whole war, permitting people to grow their crops. We do invite you to look at Kamenetsa unashamedly in January of 1993, and to look at Ustipratsa in June of 1993, and to look at the passing of the column, and to look at Selikovic, the Muslim communications officer, Wounds treated, fed and released. The eight boys on the 18th of July at the 4th Battalion Command Post, released from work and sent back to Shemso Muminovic. 
the 150 prisoners in the prison at Standard, whom Vinko Pandurovic secured exchange for at Vatkovic. That's probably inelegantly expressed, but you know what I mean. I I'm not going to romanticize it by invoking the image of Schindler, as did Mr. McCloskey. But there was something that Vinko Pandorovich said, <clears throat> which I will commend to you. And he said this, those who were in my hands survived. And that's true. Those who were in his hands survived. Mr. Hayes. <clears throat>you speak a bit softly, I better put my headphones on. <laughs> I've never been accused of that, Mr. Haynes. <laughs> First, um, on this, the question of command and control, um, there are various references throughout your brief uh, on this particular issue. But there's one particular question I'm, or one particular point, I'm not clear on it, and it's a statement you make at paragraph 455 in the brief, page 103, and it's, I believe, the only time, or at least the only time I could find where you make the statement that as commander of TG1, Mr. Pandurovich was not the commander of the Zvornik Brigade. And what I'd like to know is, is your position on that specifically. Is it your position that at any point from the 4th to the 15th of July, Vinko Pandurovic was not at law or in fact the commander of the Zvornik Brigade? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the form of that question. I'm not asking about in command or responsibility or effective control at this point. I'm asking squarely, was he at any point not the commander of the Zvornik Brigade? The way it's framed in that particular paragraph, it references to his other responsibilities at the time. I I'm sorry, you're, you're in a titular sense, you're saying, does he ever cease to... To be the commander of the Zvornik Brigade during that period? In a titular sense, no. Um, to give a ridiculous example, were he to have gone to a cocktail party, people would have introduced him as the commander of the Zvornik Brigade. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, moving then to the question of effective control, and here I'm speaking about effective control as it's been defined in the jurisprudence for the purpose of determining the superior-subordinate relationship. In the abstract, to begin with, is it your position, or what is your position, as to whether more than one person can have effective control with respect to the same unit or brigade <coughs> at a particular point in time? <clears throat> um, the simple answer to that is yes, they can. Um, I can't ignore the jurisprudence on that. Um, the, it, it, I've foreshadowed this, I think, briefly in my submissions today. Effective control is an evidential question rather than a legal one. And, and, and we, we do invite you to look very carefully at, at, at the uh, effective control of people in, in the uh, detention and execution areas. Um, but the answer to your question is no, I'm not submitting for one minute that people, um, as it were, switch from one to the other permanently. And then taking the very specific situation then, Mr. Haynes, with reference to a commander and a deputy commander, is it your position that both 
a commander and a deputy commander can have effective control over the same unit at the same time. And again, I appreciate effective control is always a factual evidentiary determination. But is there anything barring um, both the deputy commander and the commander having effective control? Um, theoretically, there is nothing to prevent that. In practice, I find it hard to imagine an example where it would happen. When we're talking about effective control, not the exercise of effective control, but actual effective control. The Let material ability that's spoken oh, about, for example, yeah. in the jurisprudence. Yeah. Is there any difficulty then with both a commander and a deputy commander having effective control in that sense? No. Okay, thank you. And the one final point, and I'm going to take you to Right. Um, I don't think we have any further questions for you at this stage, uh, Mr. Haynes. Now, um, uh, at the beginning of the sitting, we were informed that you would like to address the chamber. Mr. Bougon, very briefly, please. Indeed, Mr. President. Uh, we've been informed on Friday that the prosecution uh, would like to take the, the floor for about 15 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, on behalf of Dago Nikolic, there are uh, three questions I would like to address after that. And these questions are two that were put to me by uh, the trial chamber, which I would like to come back to. And the third question uh, arises from a question which was put to the prosecution earlier on, which is not specifically addressed either in our brief or in our oral arguments that would like to come back to, and that has to do with the nexus. So I'd like uh, no more than 15 minutes to address uh, these uh, three questions. And I take this opportunity, Mr. President, to, uh, I'm not sure if my colleague intends to answer this, um, this point, but I raised during my oral arguments, and that was at transcript page 34530, line 20 to 34531, lines 10, the issue of Milici Hospital, which no longer appears in the prosecution's pleading. So I'd like to know if my colleague does not answer this question. I would like the question to be put to him so that I know where my client, uh, Drago Nikolic, stands regarding Milici Hospital. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And you were suggesting that you go, uh, if we grant you authorization, after Mr. McCloskey or before? After, Mr. President. Yes, let's hear what Mr. McCloskey has to say. Given, as you've been reminded, as we all know, it's the prosecution's burden. The prosecution should go last in responding to this, any new uh, evidence. We have uh, roughly 15 minutes uh, left, Mr. Bougon. Uh, decision is to uh, grant you the request that you have asked, but uh, it's also a decision that you go first, and uh, then we hear what the prosecution has to say, and if necessary, um, uh, 
uh, consider whether it's the case of asking you uh, or of allowing you to uh, say anything further. So we will use the next 15 minutes for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I will move immediately to the uh, first question, which was uh, put to me in private session. So I think we should go into private session, Mr. President. Sure. Let's go into private session, please. Supposed to uh, put to me, Mr. President, had to do with conspiracy, and that was uh, at uh, transcript page 34548. The question related to uh, our temporal limitation argument. And on that day, Mr. President, I said the following. I said that our theory of conspiracy to commit genocide is a continu continuing crime, and I said that this theory had been rejected by the ICT ICTR, sorry. However, what I should have said and is that we submit that conspiracy to commit genocide is not a continuing crime on the basis of the ICTR case law, holding that incitement to commit genocide is not a continuing crime. The appeals chamber in Naimana held at paragraph 723 that the crime of direct and public incitement to commit genocide uh, was completed as soon as the discourse in question is uttered or published, even though the effects of the incitement may extend in time. It is therefore our submission that for the same reason Conspiracy to commit genocide is not a continuing crime. The Zigiranya Razo trial chamber, I'm uh, sorry for the pronunciation, considered at paragraph 389 of that judgment that the crime of conspiracy to commit genocide is complete at the moment of agreement, regardless of whether the common objective is ultimately achieved. Similarly, the Musema trial chamber held at paragraph 194 that the crime of conspiracy to commit genocide is punishable even if it fails to produce a result. The prosecution all alleges in this case that the agreement to commit, commit genocide would have been concluded on 11 or 12 July in Bretunats, that is paragraph 34 of the indictment and that the mass killings commands on 13 July, that is paragraph 30 of the indictment. This means that the conspiracy to commit genocide was completed on 11 and 12 July, and that the genocide would have commenced on 13 July. It is therefore the defense's position that on the basis of the ICTR case law, the conspiracy to commit genocide would have been completed on 11, 12 July, and that the situation thereafter is regulated by the law relative or relating to genocide. Consequently, anyone allegedly involved in the crimes committed after the conclusion of the agreement to commit genocide on 11 and 12 July could possibly incur liability for the crime of genocide, provided, of course, that all relevant conditions have been met but not for the crime of conspiracy to commit genocide. Finally, it's, it is not excluded that the example given by uh, Judge Frost of Judges Stoli and Kwan joining a conspiracy uh, concluded by Judge Frost and Judge Asius could result in liability for conspiracy for Judges Stoli and Kwan if the criminal activity has not commenced prior to Judges Stoli and Kwan joining the conspiracy. However, if the criminal activity has commenced, we submit that in this particular example, Judge Stoli and Kwan cannot join the conspiracy, but rather their conduct will be regulated by the law relating to the criminal activity that would have been committed in such an example. I move quickly, Mr. President, to the last question, which is the one that was asked to the prosecution in two places at transcript 34261 and transcript 34288 relating to the nexus 
which is required between the military column and the attack on Srebrenica within the concept of crimes against humanity and the chapeau requirements. Our position in this regard is the following. First, we acknowledge the decision of the appeals chamber that crimes against humanity generally can be committed against combatants all the combat, or in other words, combatants all the combat can be victims of crimes against humanity. But that's only the beginning and part of the argument. The underlying crime must be committed, of course. In this case, forcible transfer. In the absence of any specific allegations in this regard, if we talk about forcible transfer, Lex Specialis, which applies, is IHL, International Humanitarian Law, and that would be Article 49 of Geneva Convention 4, and not Common Article 3, as mentioned by my colleague from the prosecution. This fits in the economy of Article 5 of the statute, which requires that an attack be directed at any civilian population. Hence, even if the trial chamber was to find that forcible transfer can be committed against prisoners of war, for the purpose of crimes against humanity, two additional requirements must be fulfilled. First, the commission of an act which by its nature or consequences is objectively part of the attack. And this must be coupled with, of course, knowledge on the part of the accused that there is an attack on the civilian population and that his acts are parts thereof. If the accused does not have both the knowledge of the attack directed against the civilian population and the knowledge that his acts are part of this attack, then he cannot be found guilty of a crime against humanity. In Muxich, the appeals chamber said that the fact that the perpetrators of the crime acted in the understanding that the victims of the crimes were selected both on their perceived involvement in the Croatian armed forces and as such were treated differently from the civilian population precludes that they intended that their acts form part of the attack against the civilian population of Vukovar and this rendered their acts so removed from the attack that no nexus can be established. Paragraph 42. We believe Kindly slow down. Thank you very much. I apologize. I'm just trying to fit in the 15 minutes, and I'm almost done. So I apologize. We believe that the situation in this case uh, concerning the men from the column on one example and also the men separated at Potocari, which is another example, but that in both cases, these men were also treated differently from the local population. In our submission, they were legitimately transported as prisoners of war to detention facilities. And the evidence, of course, shows that the attacks directed at the column uh, was legitimate because the attackers acted in the understanding that they were engaging members of the ABIH or combatants or civilians who directly participated in the hostilities, which is the part that was already covered in our brief, so I'm not going to expand on that. But the thing that the attack could have been attacked lawfully, it is uh, incorrect for the prosecution to talk about a gray area today. The column was a legitimate attack, and the attackers, when they attacked the column, they were not attacking or doing acts which form part of the attack against the civilian population of Srebrenica, which the prosecution acknowledged in responding to the trial chamber's question, began much earlier and dealt with something completely different from the column retreating and being engaged. The Lex Specialis, again, which applies in such a cir circumstances, is the law of armed conflict, or IHL, and the fact that the column could have been attacked lawfully precludes the, quali the qualification of these acts as crimes against humanity. Uh, I, could, I had more, but I'll stop here, Mr. President. I think I made the point that I wanted to make. Uh, the last thing I can add is there are the understanding of those who attack the column is one thing. 
The understanding of those who separate demand and put au chari is a second thing, but what is important for our client is the fact that Drago Nikolic, when he is in the Zvonik area, the information that he has is about prisoners of war and no, nothing about that this would be part of the attack on the civilian population of Srebrenica. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. You, President. Thank you, Mr. Bourgon. Mr. Uh, McCloskey, um, uh, what's your forecast uh, for tomorrow? Now that you have also heard Mr. Haynes and Mr. Bourgon. I hope not to take more than 15 minutes um, for t two different uh, responses um, to Pandorovich and to Borovchen. And um, I, I will review everything again, try to get it down to the essence. Um, and I would hope no more than 30 minutes. I don't think I have more than 30 minutes left in me. Okay, thank you. And uh, that means Mr. Kirgovich, Mr. Joss, and uh, Ms. Nikolic, Mr. Bourgon, um, uh, please, uh, your client uh, will be expected to make their statements uh, tomorrow. Okay, um, uh, you may agree amongst yourselves who goes uh, who goes first. Yes, Mr. Joss. Uh, th there are also a small number of corrections from Friday's transcript, which I'd like to make tomorrow, yes, if I may, please. Of course, we'll take of no course, time at of all. Of course, that applies to everyone. Thank you. Uh, we'll stand adjourned until tomorrow morning at nine. Uh, tomorrow is in the afternoon um, uh, at uh, quarter past uh, two. Thank you. All rise. Thank you.